We'll see how far this gets me. <laughs> oh, see, now it already disappeared. Um, we're jumping a little bit ahead this morning because um, typically next week is Epiphany, and typically we would do these this verse and the story of the Magi um, next week. But Pastor Dan and I have kind of been going back and forth the last week and a half in regards to gifts and gifts and passions, and so I said, well, I'll just do the story of the Magi. So we kind of just took a little free will and bumped it up a week. So some of the things I want to start with is, um, who are the wise men, which Pastor Dan told us a little bit about. Um, How many of you knew that the wise men had names? I know, didn't we always just grow up like the three wise men? (laughs) You know, I don't know, Larry Paul Curly all showed up. I don't know. I mean, as, as a kid, it was just always the three wise men. Well, actually, the three wise men are um, Belshazzar, Melchior, and Melchior, and Caspar. And it's really interesting because they represent kind of the three kings of the area, or scholars. So one was an Arabian scholar. Um, one was a Persian scholar, and one was an Indian scholar. And then what are the three gifts that each of them brought? And what, okay, so well, we kind of know what gold is, right? Is gold cheap? No, very expensive. It's very valuable. So the physical properties of gold is it's, it's very valuable. What about frankincense? It's a spice perfume, okay, and myrrh. Gotta say it louder, I'm getting old. It's an anointing oil, okay. So those are those are the three things we have. We have an anointing oil, perfume, and something that's solid and valuable. Now, something else interesting that I learned on top of that was they each have spiritual meaning. So not as not as they have a physical property as a physical gift, but they also have spiritual meaning. So gold is also a symbol of what would you get? Well, kingship, power, kind of along that line. And then frankincense as a myrrh. I don't know if you guys would know this. I didn't know that. It's an incense as a symbol of deity. See? All these new things that you learn that you, you know, if your brain's been dead after all these Christmas things, I'm going to put more information in you. So we have perfume, but it's also um, a symbol of the deity. And the anointing oil. What do they use myrrh for most typically? I always thought this was creepy, but. Oh, well, what did they use it back then? It wasn't. Embalming. It's an embalming oil, but also and used as the symbol of death. So, if you think of the spiritual meaning of the gift, it's almost like they brought the future of Christ to him as a babe in the manger, right? So they brought them symbols of kingship, right? Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. As and what did they nail? What did they put when he was nailed to the cross? King of the Jews, right? Perfume, frankincense, a symbol of deity, right? God incarnate, the babe in the manger, as God comes to us, and also myrrh, the ultimate symbol of death, right? That Christ came as the king, lived among us, lived among us and then died on the cross for us. So that's kind of the, I just wanted to give you a little, just kind of a little background, because I think it's very, when you start putting the whole thing together about who these men were, that they traveled far, they brought gifts, they were considered scholars, and at some point the Magi were also kind of considered on the out, because they did, they used astrology a lot, they used the stars to talk about um, the future. And here is this gigantic beaming star that they saw and said something really important is there and we need to go there. So they brought physical gifts with them on 
last long journey. Like I said, they showed up when um, Jesus between about one and two. But also, these gifts of who they are, or what they are, I mean, they brought themselves. They came, they brought the gifts, not only physical gifts, but the spiritual meaning of the gifts of what they brought. And so I want to take that and bring it to today. We've talked a lot about gifts. The end of the year, what do you hear the most of any organization about the importance of the end of the year? I get about 20 of them in my email box, so I'm sure y'all are getting about 20 more too. For a lot of people, this is the end of what kind of year for them? Their fiscal year, right? So a lot of times we hear is about monetary gifts, about supporting with our money, supporting with um, the things that we have. How can we help out financially? We just got done with Christmas, which is all about what? Gifts! Gifts! Right? It's about giving and receiving. And having little children in our house, we know sometimes that it's very hard to talk about, you know, giving gifts versus Santa bringing gifts. And how exciting it is when Santa comes to your house and we get to honor our own present. Right? And what about the opportunity of giving a gift? You know, that's a big lesson that we were talking about in our house this year. And uh, our children did recordable books for parents and grandparents. Do you guys all know what those are? They're the coolest invention, Grandma and Grandpa, those with little ones, okay? It goes both ways. You can record the story either you to your grandchildren, or you can have your children read the story to the grandparents. Now, those in our family close your ears for the next few minutes. How many of you use Santa as a motivator in your house? <laughs> oh, please. Come on, help on the shelf to Santa. Right? I don't know about you, but in our house, we have a direct phone line to Santa. It's called the parental Santa line, and we use it. And it was very an interesting year this year to teach our children who know the Christmas story, I mean, gee, I was surprised when Noah was like, oh, they sang, okay, that's good. The other people brought gifts to Jesus, so we have to bring gifts to Jesus. Is my Santa list complete yet? But we're teaching them how important it is to do something for somebody else. Now, as amazing as those recordable gifts are, I don't know if you've ever tried to corral three children to read one book. Anybody try that? We corral three children to read eight books. Santa phone language. I'm ready. It's a very interesting process to talk about Santa bringing gifts for kids and for kids to give something to somebody else. Hopefully this gets better as we and our children get older. But it was a real struggle this year. You know, because it's like, are we done yet? Are we done yet? It's almost like being on a trip with kids, right? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I have to go to the bathroom. Can we stop? No, the restaurant was two miles behind us. No, we're not stopping. But I have to go. I'm hungry. I don't want to listen to this video. Anybody been on those kinds of trips? Okay, recordable books are the same thing. Are we done yet? I don't want to read that story. I'm done with this. I don't want to do this. But here, if you want Santa to bring you any gifts, but you know how much have we lost and I joke about this about our kids but how much have we lost as adults and as a community and as a society how much have we lost the importance of not only is there a spiritual is not only is there a physical gift that we give somebody but what's the meaning behind a gift What's the meaning behind what we give to somebody else? Is it all about that we want to make sure that each gift is equal to somebody else? Are we going to make sure that, that if um, 
If I give you one gift, and I have to make sure I give you a gift, and I have to make sure I give you a gift, and you a gift, and it has to be something big, right? We kind of play this game of, of, of what can I give? But what if we took the gift away from the three wise men? What if the three wise men showed up who they are to just be with Jesus? How many of us would see that who those three magi were were a gift all in themselves? I know if I was four, I'm sure that I would seem pretty idiotic. What's the point of coming to see somebody and they're not going to bring a gift? But when we have and we grow and we mature in our spirituality, we realize there's something else beyond the gift. Right? There's something beyond what we hand and physically give to somebody else. Because who we are is the ultimate gift. See, many people thought the problem with Jesus was that he was supposed to come and be the physical king and the physical savior. And what does he continually tell people in the Gospels and in the New Testament? I am not here to be the physical king and leader. I'm here to be your spiritual leader. I'm here to teach you the things that you need to know to grow and have a spiritual fulfillment in life. And that the gift of who you are is your ultimate spiritual gift. Who you are as a person, who and what you bring as a person. And I talk about those all in the aspect of passion. Because the passion and the things that are near and dear to our heart are the gifts that we give. And it's funny because Beth again and I have talked quite a bit about them, about what our passion and what our gifts. What is set aside and what is a part of who we are? And it probably still goes on. We're just building up to our dialogue segment. Because if you are not passionate about what you do and the gifts that you have been given, then what's the point of having the gifts? We talk about this in the light of ministry. You know, it's it's, we all sometimes think, and I hear this a lot, in all my years of ministry, it's the one thing that I hear all the time. It's about the frustration about physical, monetary gifts. And I'm here to tell you that ministry and growing in spirituality have a whole heck of a lot more to do with what you put in the place and it has more to do with what's in your heart and what's in your spirit. Everybody comes from a different place, but I can tell you that everybody has abundance of gifts and of passion. People who are passionate about their work. Doesn't matter if you get paid to do ministry. Doesn't matter if you are a doctor, a lawyer, does that matter if you're a carpenter? Does that matter if you're a housekeeper? Does any of that truly matter in the, great, in the greater scheme of life? What matters most is are you passionate and do you care about what you do? One of my friends based on Facebook, she works um, in the service sector, and she, by about the middle of Christmas afternoon, one of her posts if one more person tells me that they're sorry, or they have to make a joke about me working on Christmas, she thinks I'm going to explode. People work every day, 24-7, in different aspects of their life. And it's not about whether we think that's above or below us, if we work weekends, we work holidays, She's passionate about what she does.
does. She loves to work with people. She works with people because she likes to work with people and she's good with people. What are you passionate about in your spiritual life? What are you passionate about in your everyday life? Are you passionate about working in the church? Are you passionate about working in the community? Are you passionate just working one-on-one with people? Are you passionate about those who work at computers? Who sit behind desks and who do data entry all day? Mike and I have this conversation all day. At the end of every day we go, I went to your job and no, I would not do your job. I like my technology, but if I had to deal with it eight hours a day plus some, I would probably pull every strand of hair out I possibly have. I only use my technology because I have to. I have to chart on my computer. That's it. I would rather sit in a room and be one-on-one with a patient and a family. But that's what my gift is. And it doesn't make me better or less than Pastor Dan. It doesn't make me better or less than who you are. It doesn't make me better or less than any of my friends and whatever they choose. Because I may not have a million dollars to do what I'd like, to give to the church, to give to the ministry, that ministry, or to throw the biggest birthday parties I have for my kids. But you know what? I'm passionate about what I do. And who I am and the passion that I bring, that's the gift. That's the gift of the Magi. That's the gift of those who found a star and said, you know, there's something important and I'm going to go do that. And how many people thought they were not? All right, see ya. Have a good life. Back on your camel. It's not about what they bring. It's about who they are and what they did. It's about that no matter what society thought of them because, you know, they were, although they were scholars in some aspects, they were well-liked in other aspects, they were kind of considered nuts. Who really cares about the stars? Who really cares about this? What do you think you're doing? You're wasting your time. They didn't see it as wasting their time. They saw it as bringing their passion and doing something that they were called to do. And that's one thing that I want you to leave here with today. To think about what is it that God has given you as your gift? What is it that you're passionate about? What is it that really leads you to do what you want to do, despite what everybody else thinks? What is it beyond the material gift? What is it that God, the God who called you, the God who named you, who knew you before you were born, what is it that that God is calling you to do? What are you living out? What are you doing in the church? What are you doing in the community? What are you doing for yourself? What are you taking the time to be passionate about? And what are you going to do with those gifts? The gifts are great when they're in a box and they look all pretty all nice and wrapped. But sometimes we do just have to rip the wrapping off and we have to get inside to find out what is that special gift. And you each have a gift and you each are passionate about something. And God doesn't want you to hit, to stop doing what you're passionate about because you don't think it's enough, it's not good enough, or you're not good enough. Because whatever God has called you to, that's the good enough part. We don't have to be perfect. I know I'm not perfect. Come to our house some morning. But that doesn't make me not passionate and not a spiritual person. That makes me human. And I think we're all on that plane. Last time I looked. But what is it that you're passionate about? What are you going to do in the new year that you're passionate about? What is your gift? What is your spiritual gift? What is the gift of who you are? And what are you going to do with that gift? 
because God calls us to use those gifts in different ways. And my hope and prayer for you this new year is that you discover what you're passionate about, that you discover what God's spiritual meaning is for you. Because we're all looking for the baby in the manger, and we're all on a journey. And my prayer is that you find the gift and the passion that God has blessed and pursued each with. Amen. At this time, I'm going to invite them. Stuck on something. Uh, I forgot to tell Anna that we're going to sing this morning, but I've got an excuse. Getting a little older. Uh, we're going to sing Mary Did You Know. Ready, Ken? Did you know? 